Hi everyone, good to see you. Ni hao. Great to be back here in Hong Kong. I'm going to be talking about uh, what I'm seeing in the capital markets and how that's going to heavily impact Web3 and DeFi in the immediate term, and so in the next few months and into the next few years. The three big trends that are basically emerging now are that data is now becoming directly connected to value. This is what real world asset tokenization is. So real world asset tokenization is the connection of data about an asset to the value of an asset in a single unified golden record. And this is very different from how the world works in the traditional systems now, where the transmission of value and the transmission of data happen in separate systems, completely separate systems, and those completely separate systems then need to be reconciled. So this is one of the very big advancements. The second very big advancement is that in the traditional current markets, you have the payment system and you have the asset transfer security system. And the payment system and the asset transfer security system are once again two separate worlds and two separate set of systems that completely operate independently of each other. And what we're doing now in the blockchain industry and what's slowly now starting to happen in the capital markets is that the transfer of data being connected to value and the transfer of payments and assets is now happening in a single system. So payments and assets will now exist in a single system. The third big trend that is driving a lot of the adoption by banks, asset managers, and capital markets that will now go on to heavily influence DeFi is what we call the global internet of contracts. So this is the interconnection of all the different blockchains into a web of interconnected chains that can all transact with each other on the topic of assets and payments. So you're basically getting to a single global internet of contracts. All of these three trends are basically taking place right now within the real world asset tokenization boom. The real world asset tokenization boom is basically the creation of a unified golden record. So it's the creation of an on-chain contract that's injected with data that is able to prove things about the asset to anyone who has the contract. So in the existing world, the asset ownership doesn't actually convey any understanding about what, hap what happens with the asset. But in the new world that we're all building together, you're able to see what the status of the asset is directly by owning it. So for example, gold coins. If you have a gold coin and it's properly connected to data, that gold coin should be getting updated about the status of the gold holdings that back the coin. And this is a fundamentally superior type of asset. This requires an on-chain state and an on-chain model of ownership and a ledger, and it requires data to be placed into the on-chain asset, into the unified golden record. And this unified golden record is basically what we help create. After you create the unified golden record with all of the critical information inside of it to make it a better asset, you need to move it, you need to connect it to a lot of other chains in order for people to transact around the golden record. You need people to be able to buy the asset and they will need to buy it from various chains. They won't be buying it within your chain. There'll be thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of chains and all of these chains need to be connected so they can transact across each other about assets. And then those assets that are moving across those chains need to have connection to data even as they move across chains. So you've generated a unified golden record. It's a superior asset. You've moved that asset to the chain that wanted to purchase it and it sent you a stable coin in return. And now the asset exists somewhere else. And data needs to continue to reach the asset in order for it to become, for it to remain a valuable unified golden record. So all three of these problems are solved by the combination of blockchains and oracles. Chainlink is the leading system for oracles and oracle networks, solving these problems of injecting data into assets, moving assets across chains, and keeping the assets updated as they move and reside across chains. 
The suite of Chainlink capabilities has greatly expanded beyond market data to include proof of reserves, identity, various computations, and the ability to connect various chains together. Basically, to make more advanced contracts, you need the inclusion of data, you need various computations, and you need cross-chain connectivity. These are kind of the tools and services that are basically required to make more advanced smart contracts. Chainlink is already being used um, across the capital markets and across DeFi to do transactions across multiple chains. This is an example of a transaction that ANZ, the second largest bank in Australia with over a trillion in assets under management is working on, where they're using CCIP to move value across chains and exchange it for a carbon credit. And they're doing that by using CCIP to send the stable coin and then to exchange the stable coin for a carbon credit. And that carbon credit is enriched with data proving that the carbon credit is valid. So you need to create highly reliable data enriched assets. You need to connect them to other chains for them to transact with each other. And then you need to manage those transactions through various pieces of data and computations. One of the two main things that needs to happen for all of this to move forward is you need a way for blockchains to connect with each other in a compliant, reliable way. So you basically need a reliable, secure connection between chains to move the assets across chains. And you need that connection to reach a certain level of compliance with laws and regulations in order for the world's banks, asset managers, large uh, financial players to participate in the market. As they participate in the market, everyone benefits because there's more, va more value in the system. This is one of the main things that Chainlink provides. It provides the ability to have a cross-chain connection not only for Web3 and DeFi, but also for the bank and asset management world where the vast majority of value resides. And in order for that connection to work, it needs to meet various legal, security, and identity requirements. So solving those legal, security, compliance, and identity requirements for how value moves across chains is one of the key factors that's going to decide if banks and asset managers do or do not participate. And the ability for banks and asset managers to connect between their chains and the ability for banks and asset managers to connect to public chains is one of the main, really I would say the main driving force that's going to provide the new value into our industry. The other key dynamic that needs to take place for the world's banks, asset managers, um, financial market infrastructures to take part in the blockchain world, once again, feeding their value into the private chain world and to the public chain world, is the ability for them to easily integrate. Generally speaking, the current financial system is a large collection of players, some of which have a technical budget, some of which do not have a technical budget. It's a big spectrum of people, anywhere from big banks to brokers. And across this spectrum, some of them are willing to invest to integrate, and some of them are unwilling to invest. So the only way to get the entire financial system onto the blockchain is actually to give them a very easy way to integrate with blockchains, which is another big part of what Chainlink and CCIP provides. It's the ability for things like Swift messages, fix messages to interface with Chainlink CCIP and therefore provide a single interface for all blockchains. This ability to provide a single interface is a very common dynamic in computer science and banking um, infrastructure where you basically have an abstraction layer that simplifies a problem. That's basically how a lot of computer science works and it's also how a lot of banking infrastructure works. So CCIP initially for banks and asset managers is a layer that allows them to connect to all chains. And then this layer also allows them to connect across chains. It allows them to invoke an event that can happen across chains. So what are, what are we really doing? We're providing all the data that's necessary for advanced transactions like real world assets. 
We're providing the connection between chains for the liquidity from all the different chains to flow into the asset to purchase the asset. We're, we're allowing people to create markets because they're able to connect all of the chains and all of the liquidity in the chains. And then we're accelerating the speed at which everyone is onboarding into the blockchain universe because we're letting them connect to the blockchain universe using their existing systems, their existing infrastructure, which is what they all want to do. And while we do all this, the providing of all this data and providing all this connectivity, we're enabling them to do transactions in a way that's compliant. And compliance is the critical missing factor for all of these banks, asset managers, brokers, all the big entities that control all the wealth in the world to onboard into the blockchain ecosystem and industry, which will then grow the blockchain ecosystem and industry past a few trillion dollars to tens of trillions of dollars. So this is the big body of work we're involved in, in addition to powering the vast majority of DeFi. The world we really want to arrive at is a world of interconnected public and private chains where private to private chain transactions can happen in a compliant way and value can flow from private chains onto public chains to use DeFi protocols, which Chainlink powers the majority of through data and other systems and services. So the next stage of the evolution of our industry is definitely more DeFi, more advanced DeFi applications, but it's also the ability for huge amounts of value to migrate from the existing system into the blockchain infrastructure and into the blockchain format. And that is where you're not going to see just a few trillion dollars more. That's where you're going to find tens to hundreds of trillions dollars more in value flowing into the blockchain industry, initially through private chains, and then eventually from pri through private chains that connect to public chains. Right now, these worlds are pretty separate with Chainlink powering the majority of DeFi and many of the top applications in Web3 across many chains for data, identity, and other key characteristics. And now Chainlink is becoming a global standard from a data and connectivity point of view for TradFi. So we are operating in both worlds. We are creating a single standard that is meant to operate in both the Web3 world and the TradFi capital markets world. Because when people want to transact, they need a price. They need a settlement price. Once they settle and once they've decided their transaction, they need to send the payment and send the assets. So they need connectivity. This is a shared problem across the Web3 world and the TradFi capital markets world. It's basically the same problem. And right now, these two worlds are developing separately because they have a big barrier in between them, a legal barrier. That legal barrier in places like Hong Kong and others, due to the thoughtful approach of the regulators and the government here, is being dismantled. So the legal barrier between Web3 and TradFi and capital markets is being reduced, which means that the likelihood and the amount of interactions between Web3 and deep TradFi is increasing massively. Stable coins are a good example of that. Other assets that are going to be more regulated are an example of that. So the challenge then, is not only how do you make a standard for data and connectivity in Web3, and not do you, how do you make a standard for data and connectivity in TradFi, but how do you actually connect Web3 and TradFi into a single web of interconnected chains and transactions that is powered by data around price, data around identity, data around compliance, because without that data, you're not going to get transactions done. You need that data for transactions to happen. And then you need the connection, right? So you've provided the data for the transaction to happen. You've provided a settlement price. You've provided identity. You've provided whatever other data is needed for the transaction to happen. Now your problem is a connection so that the transaction can actually happen, so that the value can be sent and the asset can be given in exchange. This is uh, really the world that we're going towards, a world where there are thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of individual chains. All those individual chains require large amounts of data. All those individual chains require connections. And as those chains get woven into a single big global internet of contracts, 
that's when we're going to start to see the entire world convert into a blockchain-based format for value. And this is really the big project we're involved in. It's not just building the next generation of Web3 and powering the majority of it. It's also building the TradFi implementations and then connecting those two worlds into a single global internet of contracts. So if you find this interesting, we're hiring. If you're at a capital markets or a bank, we're definitely working with a lot of your counterparties to connect you. And if you're in DeFi, um, we've helped build DeFi for many years and we're very excited to work with you. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, conference. Big round of applause for Sergey. Thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank Please you. Thank you.